Hey guys, welcome back to Father and Son Investing. Today is the June 2024 update for Treasury bills, notes, and bonds. And after all of the research I've been doing for this video, the theme boils down to tug of war. We're going to describe who's pulling on each end of the rope when it comes to Treasury bill, note, and bond yields. I talk about yields on this channel, not prices, because I think that's what people are really interested in. So who's tugging on each end of the rope? And is there someone or something who's starting to let go and who might let go in the future? So let's get started. All right, in this tug of war analogy, the flag is going to be obviously the interest rate, the yield on your US treasuries. So first we'll talk about who's pulling those yields towards the lower end, what forces are trying to work towards that. After that, we'll go ahead and talk about who or what is pulling to keep those yields up. In no particular order, here are some of the things that I see that are trying to pull yields down in the current environment. I think one of the biggest things that's pulling on the end of the rope when it comes to trying to decrease yields is the market itself. What am I talking about that? I'm talking about market expectations for what the Fed will be doing. Let's go back to October, November of last year. Remember when Treasury yields on the 10-year were right around 5%? And then suddenly it took a big nosedive. What happened in there? Well, the market started pricing in a drop. This chart here is a little bit difficult to look at, but you'll notice here in this December time range, all of these colors start dropping, just start dropping. What is that? Those are market expectations for what the Fed would be doing. That was just based on expectations, but it drove treasury yields down. By January, the 10-year yield was down in the 3 point something percent range, all the way down from near 5%, just based on expectations. And I really think that that is part of what's keeping Treasury yields down right now, is that people keep thinking that the Fed will be cutting rates. This is the CME Fed Watch tool, which I've shown you in the past. This gives you an idea of what the market expects in terms of what the Fed will do. Right now, for the June 2024 meeting, the expectation 95.6% that the rate will stay what it currently is. If we start looking out into future months for July, still pretty high percentage that the rate would stay the same. And then we get to September and the market is starting to price in a 50-50 chance of a rate cut. Let's just take a look at the following Fed meeting, which would be November 7th, 2024. In the United States, that will be the day after the election. Now, the market is anticipating that there is a greater than 50% chance that rates will be lower than they currently are today. And they're actually giving a decent chance that they would go even lower for the 7th of November. Now, I don't think there's any chance that the Fed will be cutting rates the day after the election. Can you imagine what would happen if the Fed cuts rates regardless of which political party wins? There would be accusations of favoritism no matter what. So there's no way the Fed is cutting rates on November 7th. If we look out to what the market expects by the December 18th meeting, again, we're looking at an even higher chance they think that rates will have been cut twice down to the 475 to 500 basis points range. What do I personally think? I think there may be one rate cut by December. I don't think it's coming in September. I don't think that the data is going to be such that the Fed is going to feel comfortable with cutting rates. When they cut rates, they expect that they won't have to raise them again. What else do I think is pulling on the rope to try to keep yields down? Well, I think it's every little bit of news that comes in that people can try to make themselves feel good that the Fed might be cutting rates sometime soon. Here's a headline from Market Watch yesterday. Uh, Treasury yields drop in May by most in five months after Fed's preferred inflation indicator shows some signs of cooling. The key in here is some signs of cooling. Any little bit of news that seems that, again, that there might be a rate cut coming, I think is keeping these yields down from where really they should be. I think the 10 years should be at 5% plus right now. When we dive into some of this article here, we see that uh, things came in as expected, rose 0.3%, that's the PCE, that's the Fed's favored inflation index here. And if we strip out food and energy, which is called the core PCE, it came in at 0.2%. All of that sounds really good, doesn't it? But let's dive further into these numbers. First of all, let's keep in mind that these PCE numbers can vary widely month to month. 
Here's an example of it coming from Wolf Street. I like to look at his graphical data in particular. You're gonna see that this here in blue is the month to month data. Look at how widely this varies. And so taking the six month kind of average of these numbers helps to level out some of this. And actually Jerome Powell talks about uh, looking at these six month numbers as well. So let's just take a peek at what it looks like on the six month basis for PCE, which you can see very, flattens out some of these variations. And you'll notice here, it did come down nicely and now suddenly we're on this uptick. So even though, yeah, in the last two months, uh, things are down, when you start taking the six month average, we'll see that really things are kind of up here. And what is it that's driving some of this going up? Well, it has to do with core services. It's the services part of inflation that has been really, really sticky here. And people aren't necessarily diving into these numbers, they're just getting these headline numbers. And that's really, I think, what starts driving, pulling those yields down, is just this little bit of news that we haven't really dove into deep enough to see what's really going on. And just to support how much it is that it's the services that's driving inflation, let's take a quick peek at durable goods inflation. You'll notice that this is way down. Look at the six month uh, line here in red when it comes to durable goods. All right, those are two factors that I see that are currently pulling on the rope as of June 1st. What else might start to pull on the rope just a little bit? Well, here's one thing that might start to pull on the rope towards lower yields just a little bit, and that is the Treasury buyback program. If you're not aware, the Treasury will be buying back some older securities, some of its QSIPs, and I'll give you the schedule for that here in just a minute, but essentially this is to create liquidity in the market on some of these QSIPs that just aren't going to be selling very well. If you're not aware of what I'm talking about, QSIP or C-U-S-I-P, every U.S. Treasury that gets sold has a specific QSIP. So for instance, this four-week Treasury bill that is being issued on June 4th has this QSIP number. So the Treasury has announced a tentative schedule. These are supposed to be on Wednesdays, but depending on when FOMC meetings fall or holidays, this may vary. But here's what the schedule will look like. And we'll notice that they just did this first buyback on May 28th. They're gonna be doing a buyback here on June 4th as well. And they tell you the maximum purchase amount. So we're looking at $2 billion for these first two auctions and the maximum number of eligible securities. So they're gonna list 20 of these QSIPs. These are generally gonna be ones that are having a harder time with liquidity, meaning they're not very marketable right now, depending on what the yields are, etc. Now I won't go into all of the details for this treasury buyback. You can see that on the treasury buyback page at the US Treasury's website if you want to, but you'll notice that all of these say liquidity support. So, there are two types of buybacks. They could do liquidity support, which I've just explained, trying to help with some of these securities that aren't very marketable right now. And they also have some cash management buybacks that they do uh, to keep the Treasury's cash managed appropriately. Now on this buyback schedule, they will tell us what type of security and the maturity range. So this first auction that just took place, you'll see it says one month to two year. The next one coming up on June 4th, they'll be auctioning, or actually buying back, not auctioning, the 20 year and 30 year, and again, 20 specific QSIPs from that range. Now, just take note that they will also be buying back some tips. Again, there are some specifics into all of these things that we're not gonna go into in detail on this video. I've gone ahead and decreased the magnification just a little bit so you can get an idea of just the volume here of what these buybacks will look like. Again, many of them will be two billion, but some of these will only be 500 million. So if we take the total here out to July 23, 2024, if you add up all of these, you're looking at $15 billion. Now, just how much does the US have out there in its securities? Well, the national debt right now is about 34 and a half trillion dollars. So if we're looking at about 15 billion in buybacks, that's just a drop in the bucket. So this may start to pull on the rope just a little bit towards lower yields, but it's not going to pull that hard. What is another thing that might start to pull on the rope just a little bit? Well, that has to do with the Fed's balance sheet. 
Remember that the Fed holds a lot of government securities and they've started to let these roll off their balance sheet by really just not purchasing new ones when they expire. That has been going to the tune of $60 billion per month, but as of June 1st, that goes down to $25 billion per month. So we're looking at a $35 billion difference in there that the Fed could actually be repurchasing some of these treasury notes and bonds. The idea is not necessarily to be purchasing treasury bills. So that might start to pull on the rope just a little bit when it comes to treasury notes and bonds. Again, it's only a $35 billion difference. So it's not gonna be pulling that hard when we look at the magnitude of US treasuries. Now, for the sake of brevity, I'm gonna stop here when it comes to things pulling on the rope towards lower yields. You may have some other ideas. Go ahead and feel free to leave those in the comments. I'm sure other people would like to see what else may be trying to pull treasury yields lower. So let's talk about what I think is pulling on the end of the rope towards higher yields. First, let me just uh, clarify one thing. I did say total U.S. debt about $34.5 trillion, and that's accurate. But when it comes to the debt held by the public, we're looking at only about $27 trillion. And you can get a breakdown here of what that looks like in terms of bonds, notes, and bills, courtesy of the Wall Street Journal. I think that this is one of the biggest factors pulling on the end of the rope towards higher yields. This mounting debt that the U.S. is getting is starting to make people nervous in terms of what's the plan for all of this debt. But diving down into this a little bit more, $8.9 trillion of government debt will be maturing over this next year, during 20, so during 2024. So that's $8.9 trillion that the government has to sell in treasuries just to refinance what they are going to owe to people. Plus, there is a projected $1.5 trillion deficit. Those numbers vary from month to month, but we'll just take $1.5 trillion. So we're looking at at least $10 trillion that the Treasury has to be able to sell in debt in order to pay back its borrowers and keep the government functioning. That is a lot of debt. So that's one factor pulling on the end of the rope, just the volume of issuance that the Treasury will have to do this year in order to keep the government running. Now that's just this year, but when we look out into the future, you'll notice again, these, these bars out here in blue are projections, and you'll see that we're looking at more than trillion dollar deficits out into the future. So this problem is just going to be compounding in terms of what the treasury has to sell to make up for what it owes, plus what it has to sell in order to keep the government funded. Here's another factor that I see as pulling on the end of the rope towards higher yields, and that is a percentage of the US debt owned by foreign entities. You'll see here that since 2015, this percentage has just been declining and it continues to decline. Now with that decline in foreign ownership here in green, what we have noticed here is an uptick in household ownership during these periods of rising interest rates. Now that makes sense with the yields increasing on US treasuries, households, and in the past this has also included money markets. So I'm gonna go ahead and say households and money markets those are buying treasuries in increased numbers. The question to ask yourself though is, should yields start going down, will these households still be interested in buying this US debt? So I think that's one thing that's going to be pulling on the end of the rope towards higher yields as well, is the number of households and money markets that are purchasing US treasuries now with these higher yields. Now, one thing that's interesting here on this graph that you'll notice is it shows banks and you'll notice that banks holdings of U.S. Treasuries has been coming down. I did read an article talking about how a major U.S. bank was a seller of U.S. Treasuries during the month of May. Part of that has to do with what's happening in Europe with their bonds as well. They're a little closer to decreasing their interest rates, and so banks can make money on these European bonds if the interest rates go down. Obviously, the value, the price of those bonds will go up. Here is kind of an interesting graphic to drive home the point that I've been talking about. You can see what a lot of countries' holdings look like in terms of their debt when it comes to foreign versus foreign banks, domestic banks, and domestic non-banks. When we look here at the U.S., we'll see that there's this big light blue part of the bar here, and this is domestic non-banks. This is a big part of who is holding the U.S. debt. It's about 50%. And again, we have to ask ourselves the question, 
if yields start declining, just how much of this blue bar here will continue to buy U.S. Treasuries at lower yields, they may be seeking for higher, higher yields elsewhere. What else do I think is pulling on the end of the rope towards higher yields that has to do with Treasury auctions? This gives you an idea of the Treasury auction sizes year over year. But there's something else going on with Treasury auctions that you may or may not be aware of. Let's just take a peek at how the Treasury auctions went this week. There was a two-year auction, a five-year auction, and a seven-year note auction. Let's take a peek at these. Let's start with the seven-year. So the headline here that it got issued at 4.65%. WI stands for when issued. I've talked about this on other videos, but there is actually a market for Treasuries before they're actually even sold, where they come down pretty close to what they think the yield will be. So the when issued level was 4.637%. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the government had to offer a little bit more in yield to get people to take these seven-year notes. When that happens, this is called a tail. So the tail was 1.3 basis points. Now, how has that looked over the last few auctions, the average has been 0.5 basis points. So the tail went up a little bit. The government had to sweeten the pot just a little bit more on this seven year. What else do we see? Well, there's something called bid to cover. Just think of that as the total number of dollars that were bid for the total auction size. So you can just take the total numbers and divide it by the auction size. The bid to cover was 2.43. And when we compare that again to the recent ones, 2.53 has been the average. So fewer dollars are being bid for the amount of government auctions. So that was on the seven year. All right, let's take a look at the five year. This comes from Zero Hedge and Tyler Durden. Ugly five year auction sends yields to two week high. This is the five year treasury note. They were offering off 70 billion. And let's just take a peek at what it came in at. The yield was 4.553%. That was less than what last month's was, but there was still a tail. Remember, a tail is when the government has to sweeten the pot a little bit. So the when issued market thought that it would come in at 4.54%. So the tail was 1.3 basis points. That was the biggest since January of this year. All right, I won't belabor the point too much for the two year. I'll just give you the headline here again, ugly auction, and you're gonna see similar kind of numbers here. It just, these auctions, more and more we're starting to see tails, meaning the government has to sweeten the pot, and that they're just being described as ugly or not good or, now, it's not every auction. We'll still see some auctions where things look good, and that little bit of news then brings the bond yield down and brings the bond price up. So in, on top of this larger tug of war, we have these little tug of wars going on when it comes to treasury auctions. All right, the last thing that I'm gonna cover here when it comes to what else so I think is pulling on the end of the rope, that has to do with the 10-year term premium. So if you're not familiar with that, because this is longer US debt, there should be a little bit more that investors are receiving for tying up their money for 10 years when it comes to the 10 year versus say the two year treasury note. We call that the term premium, just that extra little bit of interest that should be there for that longer term holding. So you'll see here what the 10 year term premium has looked like in the past. If you were an, a bond investor way back in January of 2009, you were getting a great term premium. Recently though, that term premium has been negative or essentially zero. Now the question is how long will investors be willing to put up with that term premium? And really the investors who tend to shake this out are called bond vigilantes. I did a video about bond vigilantes a little bit ago. I'll leave a link to that so that you'll be able to watch that video if you're curious about bond vigilantes and their effect on term premium. But I would expect that at some point this term premium is going to turn positive again because entities who are buying U.S. debt, particularly households, are not going to be willing to take lower yields when it comes to giving the government their money for longer. So that's what I see happening in the U.S. Treasury market right now. Now, what do I expect for the month of June? Well, I expect to see a tug of war going on. You'll see that this tug of war has been going on throughout the year. If I just change this to year to date, while the trend has been upwards, we see these constant pulls up and down when it comes to Treasury yields. And I think that's gonna be happening for everything when it comes to notes and bonds. When it comes to treasury bills, I think that these are gonna be holding 
fairly steady, and that's really because these are based off of the Fed's interest rate, these short-term interest rates. So even though it looks like these are changing quite a bit, the one year did change quite a bit, but if you look at the three month, really it's hovering around a narrow range back and forth. And even looking at the one month, still hovering around a narrow range back and forth. All right, if any of this was useful for you, please give us a thumbs up. If you learned something new from today's video, please uh, leave a comment. And if you have some other ideas about what is pulling on either end of the rope towards higher yields or towards lower yields, please leave us a comment and let other people learn what other factors may be playing into this battle here. Until next time, enjoy your investing.